Good evening, everyone. My name is John Taves, and I'm the event coordinator here at McNally Robinson Booksellers. Before we begin, I would like to acknowledge that McNally Robinson is located here on Treaty One territory. That's the traditional territory of the Anishinaabe, Cree, Oji Cree, Dakota, and Dene peoples, and the homeland of the Métis Nation. In addition, McNally Robinson Booksellers itself rests on the land once occupied by the Métis community of Rooster Town. We are truly delighted that so many of you could join us here tonight, both in person and virtually, to celebrate the launch of NORAD, Perpetuity and Beyond. And so grateful to McGill Queen's University Press for their support of this event, and of course, for publishing this book in the first place. I won't take up too much of your time right now. I just have a few brief housekeeping notes, and then I'll be back at the end just to review signing procedure. If you have just arrived, there are a few seats still available on this side, and rest assured there is an aisle right in the middle, so you shan't have to push past too many people. Uh, so in just a moment, we'll be hearing from your host for the evening, Professor Rick Linden. Following that, there'll be uh, some introductory comments from both of tonight's featured authors, Andrea Charon and James Ferguson. And immediately following that, there will be the opportunity for all of you to ask questions. If you're physically here in the space, I will rush up to you in a non-intimidating fashion and hold out a microphone to you. Uh, this is not a comment on your ability to project. It simply ensures that all those watching at home can hear your question and prevents us from having to repeat them. If you are one of those folks watching on YouTube, please feel free to write your questions into the chat and we will put them to tonight's authors as time permits. I'll be back at the end with some signing procedural notes, uh, so you can all look forward to that. The only thing I will put in your brain at this very moment is we will ask you all just to remain in your places for one moment while we safely transport our authors over to the signing table just by the cash desk, at which point you'll be able to join them and have a copy of the book signed. That is more than enough for me, so I'm now going to introduce your host for this evening. Professor Rick Linden serves as a distinguished professor of sociology and criminology at the University of Manitoba. In addition to his academic career, Rick also served for over 30 years in the Air Reserves, and prior to his retirement from the military, served as Chief of Reserves, holding the rank of Major General. Please join me in welcoming Professor Rick Linden. Thanks, John, for all your hard work on this. And also, I just want to acknowledge the presence or the existence of McNally Robinson and how nice it is that we have a city where we have a community oriented bookstore like this where we can have events like these. And I've been to many of them and they've all been absolutely wonderful. So uh, I think everybody realizes how lucky we are to have that. I just want to, when, I, when Andrea asked if I would host this, uh, I was starting to think of what could I say at the opening remarks. And, uh, unfortunately, the first thing that came to my mind was NORAD really flies below the radar. And when I thought of that, I wasn't actually literally thinking of radar, but then I connected the two and it sort of became like one of the dad jokes that my kids hate so much. And the next one was an, an example of how it flies below the radar, as most people's familiar, familiarity with NORAD only extends to the fact that Santa Claus uh, is being tracked on Christmas Eve. And I figured I wouldn't say that in public because it would be embarrassing to the authors. But if you go to chapter one on line 10, the word Santa is there. She missed out on Claus, or whoever wrote that, missed out on the Claus thing. But uh, so I don't feel bad about starting with those remarks. Uh, now to introduce the, uh, the authors of this book, and, and I have read through it, and uh, it, it really is a, a, a masterful work. There's anything you have ever wanted to know about NORAD, any acronym that you wish to not understand, uh, and and the uh, the caliber of writing and the the uh, intellect that went behind it is really quite remarkable. So I'll introduce the two authors and let them do their introductions and then open it up for questions. Uh, the two authors are Andrea Chiron, who's the who's an associate professor at uh, the U of M, and is the director of the Center for Defense and Security Studies. And uh, uh, Jim Ferguson is a professor and is the deputy director of that center. And for a long time, of course, was the director. So take it over, please. Thanks so much. Well, I'm gonna begin, and I'm gonna begin with a few thank yous. We've been so lucky in putting together this book. 
uh, first and foremost, we had unprecedented access to the command team of NORAD in Colorado Springs, in Alaska, here in Winnipeg, which is of course the Canadian NORAD regional headquarters and uh, in the United States. So we wanna thank them. We've had incredible colleagues who are here supporting us and helped us through the process. We couldn't have done this without McGill Queens University Press and of course here McNally for helping us launch this book. So we're very, very grateful to them. Of course, we have family here, which we're very grateful for and friends and neighbors. But mostly I think for Jim and I, it's the number of students we have here and former students and they were instrumental in helping us put this book together. The number of them who had to double check the acronyms and go back through the declassified information and read over what we were saying and say, yeah, this doesn't make sense. <laughs> so we're so grateful to uh, all the students who helped us along the way and, and many of you are here today. So thanks very much. I thought I'd start with sort of the origins of the title. It's NORAD in perpetuity and beyond. And NORAD, of course, is the North American Aerospace and Defense Command. Why in perpetuity? Well, that's because in 2006, the NORAD agreement was signed, quote unquote, in perpetuity. And it was a reflection of the fact that every couple of years when the NORAD agreement would come back up for renewal, there was great angst, at least on the Canadian side, about is this going to be signed? Will there be reasons to open the agreement? Might when we open the agreement, it disappear? And so we were really lucky to have some incredible colleagues who have written two books about the history of the Canada-US relationship up into the creation of NORAD in 1957, that was Richard Goethe, and then from 1957 to 2006, Joseph Jocko. But for Jim and I, the real evolution of NORAD began in 2006 with this signing in perpetuity. And the reason was that 9-11, was a shock to both Canada and the US and NORAD in particular. And it struck us as fascinating that NORAD with two primary responsibilities at the time to warn of any air threats to North America and to defeat any air threats to North America had fundamentally failed in its task. And yet there was never a question that NORAD wouldn't continue. And so we started by unpacking that. And there are quite a few reasons why. One, the fact that the airspace had been indivisible for so long. I think we're very, very lucky that a former NORAD commander, General Myers, just happened to be the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff during 9-11. But what we also realized was that NORAD had done some really amazing things, notwithstanding the fact that they weren't able to stop the attacks. And of course, many, many departments and agencies are, are to blame for that. Everybody had a piece of the information, but they didn't think to share it. And for NORAD, the problem was they were thinking out towards what could be coming in towards North America. It never occurred to anybody that could, there could be a threat within North America because after all, any airlines, any commercial airlines in North America would of course be friendly. And so NORAD had to really react on the fly and all of the operating procedures sort of, they had to chuck away because the way a hijacking plane would be treated with was sort of upended by uh, the perpetrators of 9-11. And what, one of the things they had to do was set up what they call combat air patrols, which then became consistent surveillance of the North American airspace. And they gave it a name, Operation Noble Eagle or One. But what we also wanted to look at was the Canadian side, because we know about where the American president was, they were on Air Force One sort of circling around North America. But what about on the Canadian side? And it just so happened that the only Canadian official on 9-11 in Ottawa 
was our Prime Minister Jean Chrétien. And it was because he and his wife Eileen had just celebrated their 44th wedding anniversary the night before. The Minister of Transportation, David Colinet, was in the Palais de Congrès in Montreal hosting 2,000 plus North American airport officials. His speech was immediately upended by the events of 9-11. And as we know from the hit musical Come From Away, Canada then had to try and land 298 aircraft and 33,000 passengers. 9-11 prompted big changes to NORAD, another evolution. Not only did we sign the treaty in perpetuity, but we added a new mission, maritime warning. And that had a rocky start, but it's sort of symptomatic of how NORAD keeps adapting and changing as new technology, new threats, new circumstances arise. The Arctic is sort of the perennial meat and potatoes for NORAD, but it too has had to change. Uh, traditionally, the threat was from the Soviet Union. We had bear bombers. And so we needed radar systems that could detect that sort of aircraft going at a certain speed and altitude. But in today's context, we have drones, what NORAD calls the low and slow problem. We have incredibly fast weapons, hypersonics, which can go at Mach 5. And we also have new threats in non-state actors, new state actors that we're concerned about. And the primary asset that NORAD has to detect of those air threats, the North Warning System, which is a series of short and long range radar across Canada's Arctic, we have some in Alaska and even down the East Coast, it had in mind a certain threat projection. So those bear bombers going at a certain speed and a certain altitude, but they were designed with 1970s technology. So think of the game Pong. And now they're trying to deal with all of these new threats and especially the new technology. And again, NORAD has found this ability to adapt and change. And you may have heard in the news about the need to modernize NORAD. And that's where we are today. And the book continues there. And I'll turn it over to Jim to carry on the story. Thanks, Andrew. Uh, and thanks everyone for coming tonight. Uh, every time I go talk to audiences, classes, I always would get around to NORAD and say, NORAD, what's NORAD? or in circles in the United States and Canada back before the events of the last, you know, changes that occurred in the past decade or so, it was known as SNORAD. Uh, and U.S. Northern Command, which is married to NORAD, is known as Sleepy Calm, because nothing goes on, notwithstanding 9-11, of course. Uh, and I always would get responses sort of like a blank stare. So I guess I'm wrong. I guess everyone here knows about NORAD. Well, at least start some interest in it. And that's good because you need to be interested because we are approaching a watershed moment in Canada US defense relations. As Andrew pointed out, a lot of this is being driven by technological considerations in the context of uh, the issue, the adversarial relations with Russia. And if you look south of the border, really more, it's they're as much looking at China as they are at Russia today. And the threats posed by new long range technologies to North American defense. Uh, so we can understand the technological. And a lot of what we talk about in the book is about the technologies that emerge and how to respond to them. And if you look at what the government has said over the past year or so in terms of the commitments they made to NORAD modernization, uh, that's what the driver is. We need technological solutions to a technological threat problem. But technology is never neutral. It always has bigger political implications. And this is the watershed moment we're approaching. If you go back to the origins of NORAD, there was a simple problem back in the beginnings of the Cold War, which was the threat of the Soviet Union and the emergence of their long range bomber fleet that could threaten North American cities. 
And the response of Canada and the United States in bilateral memorandums of understandings, et cetera, that Richard Boet and J.J. Dockle would talk about was a technological response. The technological response was simply, okay, we need to build advanced radar lines. We need to start to coordinate interceptors, air defense systems, so that we can deal with the Soviet threat to deter it and defeat it if necessary. Uh, knowing when all this started back with the Permanent Joint Border on Defense and the Military Cooperation Committee in the late 1940s, thought that the outcome would be NORAD. Wasn't in their minds. A binational command between two sovereign independent nations? Nah, no one thought about that. But after a decade of the technological response, it became clear to the military planners, the technical experts, that it was obvious that efficiency, effectiveness, a credible deterrent required something more than trying to coordinate two independent commands. Hence, you got NORAD, the binational command. Why that's important is because of the new technological threat. And once again, with technological response, the boatloads of money being spent, if you're aware of it or not, depends what numbers you get from the government, because there's lots of them out there and no one knows how to calculate them, where they're getting from, from 40 billion over six years to 87 billion over, over pardon me, 40 billion over 20 years, 87 billion over 20, 20 years, and then I've heard what numbers over 100 billion all going into this. It's a technological problem. New radar sensor systems, new communication systems, new command and control structures, all to make this work effectively and efficiently to deter, to have a credible deterrent, and if necessary, a significant defense. That's not where we're going to end up. Because of the changed environment, because of the all domain threat, which is now just not air, it's air, space, aerospace, maritime, and even the context of land. And land, it's the context of natural disasters, climate change and natural disasters, all drive at the end of the day drive both parties to recognize, whether they like it or not, that this needs to be expanded from simply bilateral relations, coordination, cooperation, which all the problems that come with information exchange, getting one to do the other and divisions of labor and all that with defense, simply won't work anymore. So the watershed with NORAD, we suggest strongly in the book, and we don't know, because it could go south and things could go bad because you can't predict the world of politics. But if the lessons of the past that we point out through the environment and the threat environment, technological responses and the changes that are occurring all lead to what, strangely enough, ironically enough, we rejected in 2001 in the wake of 9-11. That was Secretary of Defense Donald Rumsfeld argument or proposal that what we need now is an integrated North American Defense Command that covers all the domains and integrates us together. It's not won't be an easy political path at all, because as you know, and I'm sure some of you have these ideas in the back of your head right now. Oh my God, Canadian sovereignty! Oh, what's going to happen to Canada and Canadian independence? Nothing happened with NORAD, nothing went out with it, that in my view, but I think it had two That's the watershed moment, which no one's talking about right now. The book, the central argument is that that's in fact, what's really slowly going to creep ahead to one day, like it was in May, 1958, when the binational command agreement called NORAD was signed and went public. It was a shock to everyone. No one knew. No one understood what was about that, what had happened. And it was taken for granted. Of course, it didn't work out that well politically, at least for a few months, and then it disappeared. And that's another story about Canadian defense. So I could we could talk a lot about the technical issues, the analytical, the political background of all that goes on. We talk about the book. But the real thing is 
the initial steps driven by threats, environments, and technology, which have brought us NORAD, which has been highly successful. And one of the reasons it's successful, it is successful because it survived 9-11. And that's an important thing to understand, that there is what we call the NORAD mentality. There in Ottawa, there's the Canadian defense and foreign policy mentality. In Washington, there's the American defense and foreign policy mentality. In NORAD, Canadians, Americans working together. There's a North American mentality. And that's really important in our view. So I'll leave it there and open up for questions. Thanks. I'll just start off with, <coughs> sorry. We'll start off with one question and turn it over to the uh, the audience. Uh, I was going to ask a question about 9-11, because to me, that was the most exciting chapter in the book. It was uh, literally a page turn. I kept waiting to see what's coming next, because there was stuff in there about 9-11, which we all know a lot about, that I never knew anything about. And it was really interesting to, to go through the dynamics of a sort of a, a phased in uh, discussion of that what happened on, on that day and on subsequent days. But uh, Andrea answered most of that question earlier, so I won't, I won't ask that one. I'll ask something that actually sounds like a PhD comprehensive exam, which is, are the biggest challenges for NORAD political, technological, or organizational, or all of the above? So I'll give you that last out. Yeah, I'm gonna pick D. So it's all of those above, plus a few other unknowns. Um, Canada and the US, uh, we sort of take it for granted that we're great allies and partners. And every once in a while, that relationship needs to be revisited. And we need to remember why, first of all, the functional logic that brought us NORAD, but also the fact that it, it can't be taken for granted because it will be marginalized. There was for a brief moment after 9-11, when they were discussing about what would happen, it was quite clear we were going to get a U new US combatant command. The US military divides the world into these areas of responsibility headed by a four-star general. And North America, amazingly enough, didn't have one until after 9-11. It didn't occur to anybody that North America itself could need that sort of uh, coverage. It was NORAD and then a whole bunch of bilateral agreements. So when we had 9-11 and this creation of a US NORTHCOM, a new combatant command, the question was, well, what do we do with NORAD? Do we disappear it? Does it become a sub-command? Well, that can't happen because it's binational. And binational means we are equal partners. And Canada does things to help North America. And the US does things to defend North America. We're not doing things in parallel. We're doing them because we're all focused on this issue of threats to North America. And so we, after 9-11, we have this new US combatant command, and it's twinned with the commander, and Canada is right there along with it. The deputy commander of NORAD has always been a Canadian, the American, remains a four-star general and has two hats, U.S. NORTHCOM and NORAD. Where we're going to go in the future is that we have to convince politicians that it's important to spend money on. And remember, they have a lot of priorities and it's difficult to be experts in you know, healthcare and agricultural and investment and trade and everything else. And so it's often been left to the technocrats, the military experts to come up with a solution. But we're now at a stage because of the new threats coming at us and because we need to fundamentally think about how we organize to defend North America, which means perhaps new command and control. Do we need new missions? So NORAD has sort of 1.5 domains. It has aerospace warning and control, but it only has maritime warning. It doesn't have maritime control. And what Jim and I are arguing is that same functional logic that created NORAD applies in other domains. But there's great resistance, political resistance, the technological resistance. We're not sure we can pull this all together. And increasingly, we need other government departments, 
because they have a lot of the important information and allies. But the last part is the unknowns. We don't know what other threats are going to come at us if it's in NORAD's inbox. Um, the big push now among allies is to try and integrate efforts of NORAD, NATO, and all the various bilateral relationships that we have with all the allies. But that then takes a lot of coordination. And especially if we get new governments in power and they forget the reasons why, for example, we have, we're celebrating 65 years of NORAD this May, they forget or undervalue its importance, then we risk losing it. It, it risks being uh, forgotten. And the, the argument has always been, well, we don't need NORAD. It's a middleman. We've got US Northcom. We've got the Canadian Joint Operations Command. We don't need NORAD. But NORAD is the only command in the world that thinks about North America. It doesn't think Canada. It doesn't think the US. So the next step is, well, what about Mexico? Why isn't Mexico part of this? It's part of North America. And what about Greenland? Because when you look at the connections we have to Greenland and the importance of Greenland anytime we're trying to operate in the Arctic, well, maybe we need new allies. Maybe this North American Defense Command is not going to be Canada and the US anymore. It's going to be new allies, new government departments, and maybe even new missions. I agree. <laughs> not, not a great surprise. <laughs> but, I mean, everyone should know that although, Andrew, we, we've co-written a lot of things together, we agree about a lot of things. We don't always agree. That's true. And I don't know how sometimes we paper over our differences, but they're probably on the margins. But let me answer the question and sort of, I think Andrew would agree with this, put a lid on this. The answer is yes, indeed. All the above. But the real answer and I think she spoke to this in a little more detail, is organizational is B. Technology is a challenge. But so technology is one thing. And if you have some Western scientific sense about, we solve all these technological challenges, we can do that. That's, not, that's a question of money. We got money. The politics, politics have been always after the fact in the NORAD and the Canada-US defense relationship. When the, the relationship suddenly now rises above, or as Rick put it at the beginning, above the radar, onto the radar. But by then, a lot of it is a fait accompli. The real challenge is organizational. The real challenge is the services, both in Canada, national defense, in the United States, the Department of Defense and the Pentagon, their turf battles, their privileges, and I, we always like to talk about, I think I'm safe to say, about the Navy problem. The Navy is the worst because they think that they're somehow independent of everyone. We could tell you stories that we've heard about the Navy. Uh, but how do you overcome what the Air Force overcame, the Canadian Air Force and the US Air Force, not entirely, but the significant parts or sub parts of them or sub organizational components overcame to deal with NORAD, this now spills over into the other domains. How do you break down those barriers? The term that Mer Americans use and we use now, jointness. It's a wonderful term, jointness. But jointness at times is really not jointness at all. And that's where the real barrier will be. And that's what's really got to be pushed. It's a really internal organizational issue. That's the real challenge. And I think over time, for a variety of reasons, it will be slowly, like in the case of the US Air Force and the Royal Canadian Air Force back in the 40s and 50s, it was slowly overcome as a function of other strongly driven elements of military ideology, if you will. So that's what I would argue to you. And that includes going into the world of other domains, it includes the issue of Greenland and Iceland, it includes issues about space and all those things. Uh, that's the way, that's the big block right now. But I think it will move. But it also assumes we're gonna to continue to pay attention to North America and the pull, yeah. the, the, the natural tendency is to think that the best way to defend North America is to take the fight elsewhere. 
and, and meet any threats as far away from North America as possible. So we have kind of a, a moment now where NORAD is in the news and there's funding for it, but it's 20 years out and a lot can happen in 20 years. So it's the hope that we'll keep this sustained attention. As, if I, one last quick minute, then we'll go to the question. As an American military officer said to me several months ago when I was in the US, don't let a good crisis go to waste. <laughs> okay, so we can open it up to questions from the audience. Yes, me. You mentioned space. Uh, how does, and I'm curious about this, how does the Space Force, the new Space Force that's been done in the United States Air Force uh, originally, but now to be integrated into NORAD? So Space Force is what we call a, a, a force developer. So it's about creating those expertise in space. NORAD doesn't have a, an ability to train and create people. Um, they're what we call chopped over. They're, the Americans and the Canadians say, okay, we're gonna send you NORAD, you're gonna go into NORAD, you obviously get the training to do it. Um, but where we're gonna see more space is in the new satellite systems and the surveillance systems because the big push now is to be able to see threats as far away as possible. And space is really the key to being able to do that. Um, and so it will be likely getting space experts from Space Force, from our own uh, directorate uh, for space, because the, uh, the Canadian military has one as well. And, and they'll be brought into NORAD to provide that sort of expertise. But we are going to see a system of systems. So it's the combination of space-based satellites, new radars, new maritime surveillance systems, more systems on the land. Also, just the act of sharing more information, not only between the combatant commands, but with allies, with other government departments. You realize now how important, you know, uh, things like the Coast Guard and Transport Canada and NAV Canada and the FAA, they had a lot of the information that had we been able to connect with them during 9-11, we may have seen the signs earlier, but they were all stovepiped. And so a lot of the work now is breaking down those stovepipes and getting that information into one central location. But that raises questions. Who controls the information? Where is it housed? How do you access it? How do you protect it? How do you make sure that it doesn't become a, a one-stop uh, area of, of weakness? Because if you take out, if you put everything in the cloud and you take out that cloud, does that mean that we're more vulnerable? So. Every time we come up with a, a new technological change, a new way of doing things, we always have to ask ourselves, but where are the vulnerabilities that are created as a result of, of this step forward? It's a really important question, and we don't have the answer yet, because the United States doesn't have the answer yet. And it reflects three things. First, the US Space Force is really a bit of smoke and mirrors. Because what the US Space Force really is, is they took that component of the US Air Force, pulled link to strategic command and their nuclear capability, strategic nuclear retaliatory capability, pulled it out, that component, it always been Air Force, pulled it out and said, you are now separate with the command, basically a force generator command, an development command, and a training command. How that fits in in terms of the unified command plan in the United States. In other words, the operators, whether it's NORTHCOM, European Command, Indo Pacific Command, Central Command, you name it, how they then deal with this relative to space as an emerging domain, no one has worked out or figured out yet in the United States. So it's all preliminary. It's going to be wait and see in terms of other issues about integration and all domain integration and the revision of the U.S. Unified Command Plan. The U.S. Space Force in many ways has done what is not new for NORAD, it's always supported NORAD. So the key ballistic missile warning, space warning assets have always been U.S. Air Force, then in the 80s with U.S. Space Command, and then with U.S. Strategic Command, they always supported. 
And part of it was, of course, that it wasn't an operational domain command. And that depends on how that falls out, which then has issues for us. These are part of the underlying organizational and political tensions, because now you're starting to talk about what we in Canada don't want to talk about, war and space. And that's a really complicated set of issues and everyone wants to avoid it, but it's rapidly coming down the pipeline. The final thing and to remember is basically the space force is co-located with US NORCOM and NORAD in, at Peterson Air Force Base in Colorado Springs. So they're very closely tied together. There is, and I don't know this for sure, but I suspect there's a lot of personnel movement between the US Air Force, SpaceCom, NORTHCOM, and US NORAD that moves in. And we have, depending on billets as well, attached to them. So we're well aware and we have deep links into SpaceCom, as we did in the 1980s when it was first established, I think it was 1982, 83, before it was eliminated in 2001. The commander of US Space Command then was the, also the commander of NORAD and they were tightly integrated together. And a lot of this will depend upon how things play out in terms of assets in space, thinking about the space domain as it's integrated. So for the moment, it's not a real problem for NORAD. It's not a real problem for Canada. It could become a problem. But again, it's all just premature right now. Hello. Should I keep my mask on? <laughs> Anyways, OK. Uh, my name is Roger Todd. I worked uh, for the Canadian Air Force for 24 years as a management consultant. At the same time, I was moonlighting as a university professor for 20 years, uh, teaching at the University of Manitoba, University of Winnipeg, Mennonite Universities, so on. Uh, early on in working for the Canadian Air Force, I was uh, sent to Colorado Springs as part of a Canadian team to help uh, General Oblanis, who's the deputy commander of NORAD, uh, kind of uh, put some Canadian input into what the decision-making process was in NORAD. And so I ended up interviewing a lot of uh, senior American uh, uh, Air Force personnel and making recommendations basically based on their input. Uh, they were a little embarrassed at having their names associated with these uh, particular um, suggestions, uh, but that was our process that General Lennis insisted upon. Uh, the point I wanted to make, and Jim, you touched on it uh, with respect to Space Command, uh, was that I, uh, uh, was uh, invited back to Colorado Springs uh, to help uh, uh, with their input to the International Space Station, basically uh, redesign uh, Cheyenne Mountain so that they could put in a, a tracking system for space debris. And basically that happened to be my area of expertise was to basically uh, get the input in a fairly uh, I guess, conversational way from their senior officers about how they think they should, should do that. Uh, and, uh, but I had a wife and kids back at home in Winnipeg and uh, so I declined and my boss also said, no, 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 you know, you're working for me, <laughs> you don't go. So I, uh, at any rate, was really kind of excited about the, uh, the invitation. And then a few years later, we had the, uh, the, Rush, the uh, Norwegian Black Grant rocket being mistaken for a Poseidon missile by the Russians. So those uh, very serious Air Force officers I had been interviewing in Colorado Springs turned out to actually be, you know, in maybe a crisis situation. The point I wanted to make, though, was that um, I used McNally Robinson to publish a 700 page book uh, using a cognitive science approach about the start of the First World War. And I was struck by the similarities between what has been going on with Vladimir Putin and what he has en engaged Russia in with respect to the war in Ukraine, which has a lot of echoes of what Hitler was doing in 1939. Uh, and Boris Bondarev, I guess, Many of you are familiar with this turncoat Russian uh, foreign policy expert who was working in Geneva has gone public and said that they have been telling Putin to nuke the United States in some way to make the Americans pay attention. 
And I wake up every morning wondering whether or not he, he has actually done this and whether or not maybe he might nuke New York with its 18 million people, that would definitely get the attention of the American media. And I also think now it may be opportune that we're getting some, uh, I guess, attention directed at NORAD because what would NORAD be in a position to do? Nuke Moscow? Lots of interesting questions arise if we wake up in the morning, like as we did in 1941, and found that the Japanese had attacked Pearl Harbor. We are, or, or we had 9-11, of course. So this is the kind of things that keep me awake at night as an aging kind of uh, retiree for the Canadian Air Force civilian. And uh, I just wanted to make, make these points uh, and bring the spotlight perhaps on what Putin might decide to do. I'd like, I'd certainly like your opinions, please, on whether or not this is all nonsense or whether or not this is a possible, uh, you know, event on the very near horizon. So, so this is why we have NORAD. Their, their motto for U.S. NORTHCOM and NORAD is we have the watch. And that's their primary mission is to be able to detect of any threats, um, defeat them if need be. But when it comes to, for example, ballistic missiles, NORAD will warn of an incoming missile, but then it's U.S. NORTHCOM uh, that will have the ultimate defeat role. And so this is why the, there's, a, there's a conversation in Canada that's happening again about whether or not we should be more involved in the defeat side when it comes to a ballistic missile. Um, I, I will say that, uh, you know, Russia's egregious activity in Ukraine, I think, has sharpened a lot of minds, especially among the Canadian public who are used to think of, of Canada as relatively safe. Um, the, the expression of fireproof house often comes up. And attention to spending money on defense is, is often out of sight and out of mind. Um, and, and I think it's really backfired for Russia. Uh, the allies are coming together in all sorts of ways through sanctions, through sharing more information, through supporting Ukraine in ways I don't think he ever anticipated. And that is the real advantage of, of being an ally. We have each other. Um, we have the ability to share information and, and to try and support Ukraine as much as we can, and that will continue. NORAD's role and its, its real specialty is that unlike these other combatant commands that have an area of responsibility, it's defined. NORAD has a global area of operations when it comes to warning. So it can look around the world and it can provide information about any potential threats. And we have the ability through our ally system to share that information. So that's the real strength and, and the reason why I think we need to continue to support and have a NORAD. Very quickly, three quick points. One, NORAD supports the US and the Canadian National Command Authority in its early warning mission. It's all it really does except for air defense. Uh, decisions about releasing strategic nuclear retaliatory forces is, is the U.S. Yes. president's alone. We have nothing to say about it. So it's independent, it's irrelevant to NORAD. Secondly, if Canada wants to be involved in this in terms of defense, then that requires a complete overhaul of our non-participation policy in ballistic missile defense. Uh, that issue is coming down the pipeline, important. Thirdly, and the most important thing that you actually raise is that in the discussion of the North American credible deterrent, which requires the ability to detect, categorize, and defeat potential threats, it is completely and entirely framed in terms of a conventional threat. The expectation is that this was a strike against North America, against Canada, the United States, whatever. Uh, it would be a conventional one, not nuclear. But nuclear weapons are sitting in the background. They're in everyone's back pocket in this. And there are a lot of issues, which are those that haven't been talked about, have been driven underneath the surface about, what about the nuclear part of this equation? If a missile with a warhead is coming at us, how do we know if it's nuclear or conventional? 
do you think our average is going to pick up the phone and say, oh, by the way, this is just conventional. Believe us. And now you get a lot of very complicated strategic arguments about deterrent credibility. That's a debate that's going to come down the pipeline. It's another one that's hidden beneath the technological focus, focus of modernization. Evening, Dr. Sharon, Dr. Hello. Ferguson. Uh, so I'll just do quick, two quick uh, questions. Dr. Ferguson, you touched on uh, uh, integrating commands, integrating Navy, uh, Navy, air, and land in the future. What does that look like? Is that just purely domestic, or do you foresee that being uh, expeditionary in the future? Uh, and Dr. Sharon, second question, you touched on Mexico. What does integrating Mexico look like? That's all I got. Okay, uh, guys. In terms of integration, uh, in, at the expeditionary level, given the limited number of forces we have, so if you think we, the Canadian government sort of pats itself on the back of a look at, we've sent 600 soldiers to Latvia and we lead the NATO combat team in Latvia. Okay, that's very nice. 600 soldiers, that's it. Because the other members, NATO allies of the combat team have a lot more troops there. So we're in command. Well, we're not, we are and we aren't. At a very tactical level, we are, but it's already integrated. And it's integrated to the joint command structure, which we call NATO, which in my view, and Andrew may disagree with this, we get a nod. We're talking about US European command. So it's already integrated. Uh, in terms of North American defense and integration, there are a variety of initiatives designed to integrate, primarily driven right now by ensuring that their information intelligence exchange is are blocked by seamless between commands. You need to somehow to integrate them all together. So everyone's getting what is known in some circles as the common operating picture. We're all looking at the same thing. And that then leads to be able to integrate command and control systems. And once you start to integrate command and control systems, the force generators, Army, Navy, and Air Force, who generate your forces, now you have to have a central way to be able to pull those forces out as you need them together. And that's part of the integration process that's undergoing in the United States, being driven to the United States. We, because we are relatively small, outstanding those integration at the horizontal level, U.S. Air Force, Canadian Air Force, Canadian Army, U.S. Army, Canadian Navy, U.S. Navy. We have those links of integration. Uh, you talk to the Canadian Navy. They used they don't say this much anymore, but they used to back years ago pat themselves in the back and always say, we are the only Navy in the world that can integrate into U.S. aircraft carrier task force. Just like an American ship. We just become an American ship, a picket ship in this big task force. Integration. Now you're starting to talk, and all the services are able to integrate at all those levels at that horizontal level service to service. But what's happening in the United States is these are being further and further integrated vertically. Maybe it's, it's horizontal. I always get confused, confused because I'm not a science guy with horizontal and vertical. But the services are being driven to integrate, and we will integrate along with them. But you got to remember, the Americans talk, if you think in terms of armies, talk in terms of divisions, we talk in terms of battalions. And they're always, always integrated. And it's breaking down the inter-service barriers under jointness, which has developed greatly over the, in Canada and elsewhere over the past decades, but still has a long way to go. I'm so glad I co-authored with Jim when he doesn't know vertical and horizontal. <laughs> I didn't know that before we started this project. <laughs> So your question is about Mexico, and it's a long, long, long way off, but it always, uh, we were always fascinated that when it comes to, for example, the North American Free Trade Agreement, it's three countries. When it comes to NORAD, it's two countries. Um, and whenever, you may have heard that the Prime Minister Trudeau and, and Biden and Obrador were actually met in a Three Amigos meeting, which hasn't happened in a long time. 
Um, there are military liaisons um, from Mexico in US Northcom. Um, the, the threats and concerns that Mexico has are different from Canada. And we haven't yet seen the concern about that indivisible airspace between Canada and the US vis-a-vis -vis Russia in Mexico. But we're in an age of 360 degree threats. And the concern is the over attention to the Arctic means we're not paying attention to the Southern approaches. And while there's US South calm, there's that seam but again between the combatant commands. And it's those seams that our adversaries have learned how to probe because that's where your weaknesses are gonna be. We see this especially in the Greenland, Iceland, UK gap, where you have that seam between US Northcom and UCOM, NORAD and NATO. We used to have a position in NATO that would spend a lot of time and attention looking at what Soviet ships and subs might be coming down from the Arctic into the North Atlantic, because that's sort of a choke point. With the peace dividend, we did away with that position. We brought it back in the form of the new US Second Fleet, which has been stood up. And then we twin that with a NATO Norfolk command. So the, the new theme in modernizing is rediscovering those seams making sure we can cover them. And again, here's where NORAD is so important because it has that global area of operations. It can, there's nothing stopping it from warning of potential maritime threats that are crossing those seams between the commands, which is why you're seeing some new exercises called global information dominance exercises, which is really at its heart let's get everybody around the world, especially in the combatant commands, to share information, which means also then pulling along allies like Mexico and uh, our European allies and others to take advantage of the fact that we have all of that extra information. So Mexico and NORAD, they have said they're not ready and prepared. Um, but you're starting to see the start of it. And because US Northcom is twinned with NORAD, they're certainly seeing what NORAD does. And we do have time for one more question. Anyone has one? I have a follow up. Oh, certainly, I can just sneak back to you. And Nick and many of the students here were instrumental in organizing Canada's NORAD 60th anniversary. And they did an incredible job. We had uh, CF-18 flybys and we had a static CF-18 um, display and we had a cake that like rotated and they did this on a dime and they did it all. And most importantly, they kept me somewhat sane and out of jail. And for that, I will always be grateful. <laughs> Blushing back here. <laughs> uh, so just to follow up on your kind of the point about the seams there, probably the most credible non-state threat we have these days in North America would be the cartels. Is, does NORAD have a part to play in dealing with the cartels, either smuggling through maritime means or like the planes jump in the border? No, but uh, a little known fact, NORAD coming when the Soviet Union disappeared and NATO and NORAD and everybody were like, well, no, what do we do? Well, one of the things that NORAD did because of their air surveillance uh, task, and uh, Nick Alary, um wrote a beautiful uh, thesis on this, um, NORAD was asked to assist with drug interdiction, especially far out at sea, because they had those capabilities to take that information. Um, and so there is really no limits to what NORAD could potentially do. The limit is what the political officials will allow and the terms of reference. And if we're going to make NORAD all singing, all dancing, it's gonna require an opening of the agreement. There's no appetite for that right now because you're, you're always a little bit afraid, well, what, what might we lose if we open it? Um, but that's, you know, those are the sorts of things that the terms of reference will allow for some experimentation, but if we're going to start 
you know, doing, um, especially support to law enforcement. That that's always a tricky political area, which is where you take one of Professor Rick Linden's courses. Um, that that's always a more difficult political conversation. Although, as you know, we have things like the Ship Rider program. We're learning that you just get a platform and you put an American and a, a Canadian on with the appropriate officer forces, and then the ship can go everywhere. And then you just pull up wherever you are based on jurisdiction. And say, okay, Canadian, it's your turn. American, it's your turn. You done? Oh. John, is it okay for another question? Uh, we are just approaching the top of the hour, so it might be time to uh, offer some closing comments if you folks were comfortable with that. We'll, okay. we'll answer that. Um, well, we I mean, Jim and I have been at this for 10 years. Uh, we've written a number of reports on NORAD, and every time we think, well, what's next? We realize there's so much more. Like we just keep scratching the surface. And it's incredible to me how the Canadian and US military continue to evolve. And they, they are so easy to work with because they, they take criticism, they'll answer questions, they'll reflect on what we have to say. Um, and, and I think that's why they continue, NORAD continues to evolve because they're not afraid to, to think and reflect about, well, we probably can't do things differently and better. So we're open to ideas. NORAD's the only place in North America that thinks North America. That's why it's really important. And you did right, Bill, the big issue where I'm going, I think, space. That's a real big problematic one that NORAD's going to have to, the county will have to deal with together. Mm -hmm. uh, it's the sleeping dog. Otherwise, we're so, <laughs> yeah, we're so grateful to everybody online yes. who's listening in, everybody who's here. And thanks very much. Rick, for being such an excellent moderator. Thank you and for a big source of support. Um, so, thank you, everybody, and especially McNally Robinson for hosting us. So, so beautifully. So thank you very much, everyone. I just have one more, one more line. I mentioned earlier that the book is very complex. And I think from the answers you got, you can see how complicated it was. But I think we're very fortunate to have two people who are so knowledgeable about the topic that they could uh, get through a discussion like that because it is a difficult one. And uh, in addition to thanking John for his organizational skills, I'd like to thank the audience for coming because uh, let's say sitting at this part of the in this part of the room or standing in this part of the room, much more comforting to see a full house and it really makes the evening much better. So thank you all for coming. And thank you very much, Professor. It was a great pleasure to have you as part of the evening. Happy to sneak in if you don't mind for one quick second. Uh, just a few uh, very quick procedural notes before we move on to the close of the event. Uh, so as mentioned previously, we will be transporting uh, the authors over to the table, which is just beside our cash desk. Uh, after that point, I'll let you know when they're seated so you can wander over and get copies of the book signed. We do have copies of the book at the signing table itself. We also have copies available at our front cash desk as well. You can feel free to get a copy of the book signed before you pay for it. Just please pay for the book at some point before you can leave the store. <laughs> We're, I'm going to continue the gratitude for one moment. Thank you so much to McGill Queens University Press, to Andrea Charon, to James Ferguson, to Professor Rick Linden, and of course, to all of you folks, both here and virtually. The video of this event will remain live on our YouTube channel. So if you'd like to revisit it at some point in the future or share it with someone unable to make it, please feel free to do so. Otherwise, please join me one final time in thanking tonight's authors, Andrea Charon and James Ferguson.